Welcome to my YouTube channel, Truth in Motion Studios. Today, I have a very unique guest for you. Usually, I have a pastor or a therapist with me, but today, I have a historian with me, even a professor. Her name is Kristen Kobes Dume, and she works at Calvin University in Michigan. Welcome, Kristen. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Great to have you. So I wanted to tell my viewers before I ask you the first question, um, why I have you on, on the spirit, uh, spiritual abuse channel where I talk about how to recognize it and recover from it. Uh, when I was recommended the book that is making its round through the entire uh, country and also the entire world, as it turns out, Jesus and John Wayne, um, I was recommended this book by a Canadian friend who uh, herself had her fair share of experience with abuse, severe abuse in the name of uh, patriarchy instituted by God. And uh, she said, you have to talk to this woman. And uh, when, once I started reading, I realized, yes, I did. And it wasn't just shocking and revelatory and entertaining, but it was very therapeutic. and. I want to explain why it was therapeutic by saying, you know that part in therapy, when you start to think about your abusers, what was going on in their lives? Why were they acting the way they did? It's kind of like that. It, it, you create a context here that puts a sense and um, a system to the madness that many of us have experienced. And that is therapeutic because it names things, it uh, validates experiences, and it says, it's not just an accident what happened to you, it's uh, part of the system. Uh, so you kind of have turned into the boogie woman of uh, the evangelical world. And uh, while on my general uh, channel, I don't, I mean, generally on my channel, I don't uh, speak so much about what I'm against we're not really talking about what we're against, we're just talking about what is very observable and it's personal because this is my background. Yeah. Uh, so, Kristen, where to begin? I have pages <laughs> of notes. So, let's begin with, you are saying how white evangelicals corrupted a faith and fractured a nation. This corruption of the faith, that is quite a, a, the charge. Yes. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, I mean, essentially this book is a study of white evangelical masculinity um, and how it's intertwined with militarism. And it started actually more than 15 years ago, the research that went into this book. And it was, I was teaching a course at a Christian university at Calvin University in American history. And I had this little unit on Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, I wanted to show students how ideas of masculinity were linked, not just to religion, but to economic shifts and to foreign policy and to war and to militarism. And it was after that class that a couple of guys came up to me and said, Professor Dumay, there's a book that you need to read. It was actually this book. Uh, a wild at Heart, John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. And uh, I, I opened that book and sure enough, it opened with a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. And it was a, a picture of a very kind of aggressive, militant masculinity, Christian masculinity that uh, every man needed a battle to fight. And God was a warrior God and all men were made in his image. And every man needed a battle to fight and a beauty to rescue. Now this is right at the time of the Iraq war. And I noticed that evangelicals were far and away more, more um, likely than other Americans to support that war, to support preemptive war in general and condone the use of torture. And so I just started to ask how these, um, these ideas came together, this kind of personal vision of gender, masculinity, Christian manhood with broader issues, including foreign policy. Um, and then I ended up setting that research aside for a time. And, uh, or first I should say, as I looked at the, 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 these books to answer your question more precisely, um, what I saw very quickly was um, there wasn't a lot of um, Bible verses in these books. There wasn't a lot of like biblical um, exegesis. 
Uh, instead, they were looking to kind of Hollywood heroes like John Wayne in the title of my book, uh, like Mel Gibson's William Wallace in the movie Braveheart. So they were looking to kind of secular or mythical models of masculinity and then propping those up as biblical as God ordained. And that's how you end up with this very militant view of Christian manhood that you need to fight. And then it's part of this broader kind of religious system where it's up to the man to protect against all of the evils that lurk on the outside. And, and that, that protection is a God-given um, uh, responsibility, duty, and God has equipped man, filled him with testosterone so that he can protect his women and children and church and nation. And so it was a very kind of aggressive us versus them religious system that, that came around this view of masculinity. Um, the corruption part comes from the Jesus of the gospels ends up being transformed into this kind of warrior, uh, somebody who's gonna fight, who's gonna slay your enemies. and explicit biblical passages like love your neighbors as yourselves, love your enemy, turn the other cheek, right? The fruits of the spirit, the beatitudes, they are explicitly rejected um, and said, you know, th this is, you're, you're not going to, a boy's not going to grow up into a strong man and be able to defend the faith if you're turning the other cheek, kind of forget that. Um, so that's really the corruption that I, that I'm talking about as a practicing Christian myself, um, kind of seeing how these Bible believing Christians were very quick to abandon um, central teachings of the Bible in order to prop up this ideology, which arguably um, is, is in quite a bit of tension with the Bible itself. So that's the corruption of the faith um, that, that I'm talking about. Have you experienced the outcome of militant Christianity yourself? I think it's hard to move in these circles and not have experienced them in one way or another. And there are different, you know, certainly different levels of, of experiencing um, some of these um, systems. I will say that I grew up in a um, not, I didn't identify as an evangelical. I definitely grew up as a conservative Christian, but in a, in a slightly different subculture, a kind of Dutch immigrant reformed community. And so, um, I was deeply influenced by some of these teachings through evangelical popular culture, uh, right, through books like Wild at Heart, through Christian radio, Christian music, um, and that's actually a, a central theme of, of Jesus and John Wayne, just the importance of popular culture in um, dispersing these ideals. Uh, but um, so, so I was kind of on the edges of this. But certainly, you know, in Bible studies, in churches that I, I joined as a young adult, um, this, this kind of um, gender difference was very much at the heart of, um, of, of how faith was structured. So you had women's Bible studies and you had men's Bible studies and you had women's roles and you had men's roles. And I never fit well in the women's um, bracket, in the women's category, uh, right? I, I wasn't super into homemaking. Um, I had a career, um, just the kind of uh, stuff that went with the, you know, being a Christian woman never really connected well. Um, but I didn't come up against some of the really the harsher edges of this. Because um, one thing I'll say that that connects very much, I think, with um, your audience is that um, this was, again, 15 years ago that I started paying attention to this topic. Um, but then I ended up setting, setting this research aside for a long time um, for a couple of reasons. One, what I was finding as I was digging into this was incredibly disturbing teachings, um, misogynistic teachings, um, just really crass. And, and I wasn't sure, you know, do I want to shine this bright light on what might be the dark underbelly of American Christianity and connected to that, I just wasn't sure, is this mainstream or is this really fringe? And if it's fringe, you know, how, how significant is this? So I did set it aside. Um, but then in ensuing years, I still paid attention to, to many of the men at the, at the center of this, this story that I was trying to figure out. And one after another of these men who were promoting this very militant ideal of Christian manhood became implicated in sexual abuse scandals um, or abuse of power situations, either directly or indirectly by covering up for their friends who were implicated directly. And, um, and so that's when I began to kind of understand the contours of this. 
And that's why the book is both about um, kind of this, this militant masculinity, um, militarism and, and Christian manhood in terms of politics, but also very much in terms of families, churches, organizations, and abuses of power within those situations. Oh my, uh, and it is shocking to read of so much cover up. Yeah. Um, why don't we go there right away? What is going on with this system where the abusers won't, first of all, recognize that what their experience is abuse, and then number two, if they recognize something's wrong, they will not seek help, talk about it, uh, or put any evil words or in the reputation of the anointed. What's going yes. on there? Yeah. There's a lot going on there and it goes way back. So I'm a historian and I wanted to kind of figure out the, you know, where, where did this whole ideology come from? Where did this, this, this whole kind of militant masculinity and, and, and also the flip side is what sort of femininity goes along with that. And so I went back, you know, decades, generations and um, became fascinated with sex manuals, evangelical sex manuals written in the 1960s and 1970s. And what I saw there was um, this, this idea, again, that um, men and women are very, very different. God created them very differently. And um, that applies especially to sexuality. And so, again, men are filled with testosterone. So they have this very aggressive sex drive. And that's just the way God made them. And that's linked to their aggression. That can also be used, right, to defend um, and protect. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why it's up to women to protect morality. And they need to do so through their modesty as young women so they don't tempt these you know, aggressively sexual men. Um, and as wives, it's also their responsibility then to meet their husband's um, aggressive sexual needs or extensive sexual needs, however you see it. Um, and, and so this, this is, has been taught to evangelical women for generations that it is on you to not tempt a man who is not your husband, and it is on you to meet your husband's every sexual need within the bounds of heterosexual marriage so that he does not go astray. Um, and, and that's important just for the kind of social order, but it's also important um, that you prop up your husband's ego, um, that you meet his needs so that he has confidence and strength and can, and can lead as God is requiring him to lead, not just your family, but church and nation as well. And I was really surprised when I was reading these, you know, sex manuals and I was reading, you know, advice books to women by women, just how important like the nation was, how important this militarism was, that they understood that intimate relationships within families in the bedroom were connected to these bigger issues as well. Um, so then what I, what I came to see and what I think, you know, uh, many, many of your listeners have probably experienced is this does, these expectations do set up for, um, uh, a certain kind of abuse and especially a certain response to that abuse. Because if a man uh, steps out of line through sexual misconduct, through abuse, uh, even abuse of his own wife or children, so often in, uh, in this history that I was uncovered, it's the women themselves who get blamed. Even if it's a young girl, um, she will be, you know, accused of seducing even her own father, right? Again, that, that this is placed on women, blaming women just as a natural part of this system. And there is also a very strong tendency to, um, to excuse the behavior of men, these kind of boys will be boys. They're wired this way. Again, play, it's on women to, to you know, uh, uh, put, put up the boundaries and, and to meet their needs. And so you have a, a man who might, you know, like Ted Haggard, who um, has an affair with another man, a male prostitute. And even in that situation, the woman, his wife, is blamed by other evangelical men for not satisfying him sexually so that, you know, well, this is what you get. Um, and, and so the, the strong pull to, um, con to dismiss or, or, or kind of cover up this abuse um, and to very quickly forgive perpetrators. And it's often done in the name of protecting the witness, protecting the ministry of this man, protecting the gospel 
uh, right? And, and that, that, that is just the theme that, that I saw throughout. And what grieves me uh, particularly is how this was also um, really uh, what victims themselves, what survivors themselves had often been steeped in right, that they felt they could not come forward um, because they needed to protect the pastor's witness or the father's reputation. And so this really is a toxic um, set of teachings that have affected not just perpetrators, but, but um, survivors and especially, I think, bystanders, the community itself. Yeah. So the, when the pastor does something that is uh, clearly wrong or it feels wrong, the victim won't say anything about it because they will probably, first of all, think I did something wrong. Yes. And second, expect that if they were to say something, they would become the problem. That happens very frequently. Yep. So there's a lot of taking the blame on oneself, um, right? What have I done? And, you know, what did I do to lead this man astray, to tempt this person? Um, and, and again, the ideals of purity, this modesty that are required of women, you know, who are not married to not tempt men means that, and, it, and it's a, it's a, perfect ideal, right? It's an impossible ideal. Um, so, so any woman who is, um, you know, caught up in, in any sort of abusive relationship, and you see this especially, you know, unequal relations of power, absolutely. Um, you know, also with, with minors in the, in church and youth groups, things like this, the sense of guilt, um, that the survivors carry, right? Because somehow they, they have this idea that their, their purity has been sullied or that they have sullied their own purity and not understanding and having the language or the framework to understand, you know, what, what is abuse? What is grooming? How does this actually, you know, what does this, this look like? Um, so yes, on the part of um, uh, survivors, but also again, the, the, um, the families, the churches, and that's where you really see this, um, these efforts to, to keep this um, quiet, to um, isolate the, the victim, uh, and often the victim's family, and ask them to leave the church, <laughs> you know, you're, you're disrupting, that, that's such a frequent pattern, uh, and, and circle the wagons, and again, protect the perpetrator, protect the pastor, and uh, and then use language to suggest that you're doing it to protect the gospel, that you're doing it to protect the church's witness. Um, and so in, in, in the book itself, I have, I have one quote that um, I, I was just so happy to be able to include, and it's, it's from Rachel Den Hollander. And it really is the moral clarity uh, that, that the whole book hangs on. Uh, and that is, uh, she said, and Rachel Den Hollander, of course, was the, the first witness in the Larry Nasser case um, to uh, address the uh, sexual abuse of gymnasts at uh, Michigan State and, um, and elsewhere. And she also then addressed, as a conservative evangelical herself, that um, she addressed abuse within evangelical churches and had her own experience um, with that as well. Um, and so, so she's become a leading spokesperson for this, but she has this very powerful quote that she said, both in her victim statement and then in an interview with Christianity Today, she addressed this. She said, um, God does not need your protection, mm. right? And, and that, that to me is, um, is just absolutely critical. She said, you know, God only requires, Jesus only requires obedience obedience. And what that looks like is, you know, naming evil mm -hmm. and, and calling this out and, and reforming. And, and, and to me, I thought that is, that is the, the voice that was missing from so many of these, these situations of abuse mm -hmm. um, and freeing people to understand that, yes, God doesn't need your protection. Uh, we just need truth and clarity here and justice. Yeah. Truth. As Christians, our, that should be our most important value, the truth is exactly. free. Yeah. So to go there shouldn't ever be scary. Exactly. And then to trust, right, that, that this is not on, on us, that this is, you know, the, the, the fate of the church. And, and this, this, again, gets back to the, the, the broader story of Jesus and John Wayne, too. This, this sense of urgency and almost, and 
well, yes, panic, uh, to defend Christianity, to defend Christian America, to defend, you know, that this is on us. And somehow if we don't fight hard enough, harshly enough that, you know, well, well then what, that Christianity is going to come to an end, that God is going to cease to exist in this world, you know, that that actually isn't, you know, what the, it's never on us. Uh, and we are to follow, we are to be faithful, but it's really the spirit that is, will sustain the church. Right. And if we take it too much upon ourselves, really bad things can happen because it just isn't on us. And I think that applies locally. Um, but it, it applies um, at, uh, at, at higher levels as well. Nationally, I think we can we can um, um, suggest too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, internationally as well. <laughs> yes. Um, the militant way that men are being viewed starts, of course, probably in childhood, and you would you have many stories of a child beating even in the name of God. Yeah. beating whatever disobedience out of them so that they learn to behave early on. Yes. And what I have seen in my cult was that the leader clearly came out against beating children, but he was all for being very direct, mocking, um, being completely done with any kind of what you would call, and my mother-in-law told me to not say this word anymore, but just for the sake of quoting your book, I will, and you're not coming up with the term yourself, you're quoting uh, the pussification of men. Yes. Yes. My husband, for instance, before he, we got married, he had to come to Germany, into my cult, submit to the leader in order to get to marry me. And uh, one of the requirements was that he had to get baptized. So I was part of the ambush to convince him that he really needed to get baptized. Uh, I own my part in um, becoming a, the abuser, abuser as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I, yeah, that's just what it is. I swallowed the Kool-Aid and I dished it out to other people. And so this whole thing led to my husband being baptized in a November night in a lake in Germany. And so it was, uh, obviously it wasn't freezing because the lake would have been frozen. It felt like it was freezing, it was incredibly cold. He went along because he had, he realized uh, this is what he would have to do in order to get to marry me. Uh, he was very sick for uh, days after and actually then he went back to America and was just visiting. Um, yeah, so that is one of the ways that this militant men perspective plays out, that men are held to that standard Yes. You're not going to be a, a, a sissy here, right? Yes. We ask this of you, so you go ahead and do it. So what do you, what context do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, authority is key, right? Authority and power. And, and that, that's another motif that just runs through uh, the book. And the idea that, right, this authority has to be, um, it structures all of society. So it's from, you know, leader national leader down and then church leader also these are and these are all patriarchal authority structures to be very clear uh, and then the father over wife and children and this is how the authority works and obedience or submission to the proper authority above you is absolutely critical and that must be enforced it must be trained in, in children from a very early age. And you're right, many leaders um, advocate corporal punishment. Um, people like James Dobson, um, Bill Gothard, right? And then there'll be others who say, uh, you know, uh, no, um, not necessarily, or, or be careful with that, but you, you really have to kind of break the will of the child so that they learn to submit. Um, but, but again, this isn't just children to fathers, um, children to parents, it's then, um, church members to pastor and to your proper God appointed leaders. And so what I was not prepared for when I started to just explore Christian masculinity, evangelical masculinity was just how authoritarian the entire structure was and how much these um, dynamics within the family, within the home, reinforce broader authoritarian tendencies. I was not prepared for what I, I found um, in, in that vein. Uh, and then I will also say that, yes, it's, um, so on the one hand, children are trained to submit 
absolutely to authority, but male children, boys, are also trained to be taking their place as future patriarchs, as future uh, you know, leaders in this authoritarian structure. And for that purpose, they are, uh, there's a lot of advice for how to raise children and for how to raise boys. And there's a lot of fear that um, you know, since the 1960s, boys are not being properly raised anymore because of feminism, because of liberalism, um, you know, fill in the blank, especially feminism, um, this emasculation uh, or pussification of American men starts um, with boys. And so they give a lot of advice for how to build strong boys, um, have them play with other boys, not girls, um, because you don't want them to become, quote, homosexuals. Um, have them play with boys' toys, meaning balls <laughs> and guns, toy guns. Um, and then um, give them a BB gun as just as soon as they can handle it and then give them an actual rifle and, and train them how to fight. Um, don't back down from a fight. Train them in you know, fist fighting um, and especially to protect the honor of women, right? And so these are lessons that, that are, um, are just, just pervade evangelical advice on child rearing for boys, right? Again, God gave them testosterone. They're going to be reckless. They're going to be dirty and, and they're going to get in trouble. They're going to get in danger. Um, and that's just the way they are. And do not try to tame them because then they're not going to have the proper leadership skills, the proper strength in order to take their place in these patriarchal structures. Uh, when I uh, studied German and theology, I studied propaganda of the Third Reich. And the interesting words that I would find about um, gender roles and uh, children propaganda, particularly, yeah. sounds very, very similar. Boys were supposed to be yes. kept away from Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse <laughs> is uh, basically the devil from America. And who were supposed to be trained to be future soldiers, fathers of the future generation of children, yes. and females, and on the flip side, mothers, homemakers. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, so I will, um, I will say that when I first wrote uh, uh, a little synopsis of this research back in 2017 and published it um, in Religion and Politics, uh, an online publication. Uh, within days, I was contacted by a historian of 1930s Germany uh, who said um, exactly that. The, the quotes that, you, you, that you're presenting, he said, about you know, contemporary American evangelicalism could be lifted directly from writings on German Christianity and German Christian manhood from the 1930s. And I actually knew this because my outside field in graduate school was 20th century Germany with a focus on um, World War II and the Holocaust. And, um, and so I, I saw this and I, I wasn't quite sure what to do with, with this um, because of course there's, there's um, a, a very quick backlash to making any simplistic comparisons um, between anything and history. Hitler, right? Anything in Nazi Germany. Um, but I, I do think it is um, appropriate to draw some careful comparisons of what this militancy looks like, uh, what a Christian militancy looks like, and again, how um, domestic, kind of intimate, personal, familial um, teachings are linked to broader, a broader national agenda. And I think that is true in white uh, American evangelicalism and has been true for the last um, half century. And what we um, saw historically in um, the case of, of German nationalism and German Christianity in the 1930s and 40s. Right. And another aspect that is also strikingly similar is the demonization of specific groups of people. Yes. Exactly. Um, so again, every man needs a battle to fight. Uh, and to, to fight a battle, you need an enemy, uh, right? And so um, that's, that was something that, another thing I didn't expect when I started this research. When I started this research, um, I, I was working with the understanding that evangelicals embraced militancy out of their fear 
because they were afraid. Um, now, what they were afraid of, um, I came to see changes over time. So they were afraid of communism in the Cold War era. Um, then they were afraid of feminism and secular humanism. And then fast forward, they're afraid of Muslims and they're afraid of terrorists. And then they're afraid of losing their religious liberties. They're afraid of Democrats. They're afraid of, right, there's a lot of fear going on. And, and that fear is real and it is legitimate on the part of many evangelicals. But what I also came to see is time and again, these fears didn't just pop up as a natural response mm -hmm. to what was going on. They were actively stoked by evangelical leaders themselves. And I saw this first, it became clear on the local level right in their own churches, Jerry Falwell Sr., Mark Driscoll would actively stoke fear of the outsider, outsider being anyone who wasn't inside that church community, inside that fold. And you had to be very fearful of false theology, of false teachings, and of aggression aimed at, at you because you hold the truth and you only hold this truth. And so there, you, you can hear from, from members um, just, I mean, they felt that fear. They didn't dare go, go visit the church down the road, the Christian church right down the road, because they might be tainted um, or attacked. And, um, and, and then I came to see that it was that by stoking that fear, these evangelical leaders like Falwell, like Driscoll, um, were consolidating their own power because within this militant framework, they then quickly promised their protection, right? First you, you stoke fear and then you say, but come to me, I will protect you. I will keep you safe. And so I started to rethink this um, relationship between fear and militarism, that militarism wasn't the result always of these fears but that fears were actively stoked by militant leaders in order to further consolidate their own power. And, and once I saw that and that, and that clicked, um, I, I began to make a lot more sense of, uh, honestly, evangelical political history and the history of the evangelical movement for the last 75 years or so. Uh, speak to me about the Antichrist and the stoking of fears. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, there are there are so many ways that uh, that these fears can be uh, kind of um, uh, ginned up. It can be, you know, the Antichrist and uh, 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 the uh, apocalypse, and 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 that that becomes um, instantly then a cosmic battle, right? And 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 it is good versus evil, and and it is so extreme. And of course, of, of course, the pastors are always on the side of good and righteousness. And so it's a very um, um, a clear, you know, world of black and white, good and evil. And we are the side of good. Therefore, anything we do is righteous. Anything we do is necessary in this cosmic battle, right? And anybody on the outside who is not actively helping us is on the side of evil. And you can see how this justifies um, all sorts of atrocities, potentially, um, because the ends will always uh, justify the means. And that's back to the John Wayne in the title, right? That's why these heroes become so uh, emblematic. A hero like John Wayne on screen is he's always the good guy, right? And he's always going to, um, but sometimes he's going to need to use violence. Uh, because because the world is an evil place and there are evil men out there. And so we need the good guy to have a gun. <laughs> we need the good guy to know how to use that gun, to not be afraid to use that gun. We need a certain level of toughness, even crassness, even recklessness in order to protect the vulnerable, in order to protect righteousness. And so this kind of heroic masculinity really does um, inspire uh, uh, kind of potentially violence, um, certainly this kind of self-righteousness and very much this, this uh, idea that uh, the ends will always justify the means, right? Politically, uh, personally, in terms of militarism, um, just this utter confidence that God is on our side. And this attitude that you're describing I say this very carefully, I am German and uh, I have no desire to change um, the stories of our history um, just so that Germans can feel better about themselves. 
so I will go there and I will say that um, those were the attitudes of the people that were in power in Germany that had the ability and a certain picture comes to mind. As I was looking through a history book, there was, had a lot of pictures in it. It's just this hand out of a gas oven. Uh, yeah, so I feel like the reality that this is where this faith can head that, that burden kind of weighs hard on me, that the demonization of anyone will make you think it is even good to anticipate their move and to strike them first. That's the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It, it is this, this preemptive war, right? That it very quickly switches language of defense, of protection, of uh, very, very quickly morphs into, you're right, taking the first strike, um, acting you know, preemptively because we've already decided and are utterly sure that they are out to get us, right? And, and you're right, it can, um, being very careful, um, this kind of rhetoric, um, both the demonization of the other and uh, the idea of being under siege, right? This, this idea that uh, of being increasingly desperate for our own survival, and not just physical survival, but this is always linked to, again, the survival of the church, the survival of Christianity, uh, the survival of all that is good in the world, really, it, it very quickly, you know, becomes that. Then um, this preemptive strike against our enemies, against people that we have defined as our enemies, is always framed in self-defense and cloaked in righteousness. And that, um, that is how it works rhetorically. And I think the, the real question is, to what extent then does that rhetoric end up shaping the actions that people take? Yeah, and will not speak out against or go to the streets against if their leaders uh, act that way, take steps exactly. in that direction. Yeah. Mm. Uh. Redemptive violence, you spoke about that. That was a really good one. Yeah, and I, I think I think you know what you just said there too. Um, you know, there's in in Holocaust studies, there's there's you know kind of breaking down of of kind of categories of agency, right? You've got perpetrators and victims, and then bystanders. And in the bystanders is a really important category to kind of grapple with. I think historically, morally, and, and what you just said there of people who would not speak out against what leaders may be doing. And, and that's really key. And I think that's, that's, that's primarily or predominantly how I see this ideology working in that it, people who have been steeped in these teachings um, are much less likely to be able to see a conflict between certain aggressive behavior and demonization of the other and even violence as inconsistent with their Christian faith and with their core values and much less likely than to speak out and challenge that. So, you know, whether they are actively leading or condoning and, and or, or even maybe somewhat troubled but unable to articulate exactly what is is wrong here because they have embraced this ideology that actually says no this is exactly what what you ought to be doing or if not what you ought to be doing what your leader ought to be doing on your behalf and what your leaders ought to be doing so i think it's that category of bystander that is is really important to um analyze and of course in in the the study of the holocaust that is not a neutral category that's not a you guys are you know like not part of the show that's the critical category to understand how perpetrators can continue to get away with what they're doing so it is active complicity in what is happening that's the category of bystander how does a bystander 
end up becoming an activist? An activist in uh, against this or um, yeah, yeah so, or because you can also become an activist like it become more active in perpetrating um, an activist against this. I think um, You need to Have some clarity have eyes to see right outside of this system that's been handed down to you outside of the system of authority and obedience and submission um, and to understand uh, and to have some contact right with people outside of the fold um, because as soon as you do and I've heard so many stories and I talk about that some in the conclusion of my book as soon as you actually do interact with the other <laughs> with those that you demonize maybe the church down the street maybe you know an egalitarian couple who does not you know a, a Christian couple that does not adhere to complementarian patriarchal teachings but boy do they seem to exude the love of Jesus mm -hmm. uh, in their life and in their marriage um, it, for some for some, it was men who had, you know, really been in exclusive men's groups in terms of uh, studying the Bible, who maybe met a woman who was, you know, more sophisticated theologically. Um, and when you meet the other, right, whatever that looks like, and you realize they're not just their full humanity, but how um, they are contradicting the teachings that have been handed down to you that they are, that you can actually find vibrant Christian faith outside of your local church community, uh, outside of your particular religious tradition. Um, that, you know, we can talk about racial divisions as well, that the more you are exposed to real people and to reality and not the projected reality um, outside of your fold, the easier it becomes to question the teachings that have been handed down and to question the authorities that you have been taught that you must submit to. And then ultimately to question whether in doing so, you are hurting the faith, you are hurting Christianity, you are hurting your, your country, or by, by challenging that, maybe it's the exact opposite, right? That you're trying to redeem that faith, that you're trying to strengthen your nation, uh, but in, in very different ways. So I think that contact with outsiders um, is, is one of the best ways to, um, to, to fight back against the demonization of the other and to really challenge the, all of the assumptions that are at work within this, this particular ideology of us versus them, this militant ideology. Yeah, where, that, that was, by the way, a very sound advice that uh, also comes to play when you realize you are leaving a cult. That's one of the major things to reconnect with real people. And so exactly the same thing is, well, maybe it is the same thing because we're talking about the same thing. You've left your, yeah. you know, your culture, the smaller yeah. it is, I guess you call it a cult. Yeah. Uh, the more obvious it hits all the markers, it's easier to call it a cult. Um, but you meet real people once the fear has um, evaporated a little bit and uh, you realize, wow, if that wasn't true, what else isn't true? Yes, exactly. Where do you see the U.S. going now? It's a really hard question. Um, I mean, that's the second part of the, tub, the subtitle, right? Fracturing of a nation. Uh, because white evangelicals have played an outsized role in shaping the political landscape for the last half century and in being you know a, a, a critical group in uh, the rise of the religious right in um, the new kind of partisanship that we have um, in fueling this loyalty to the Republican Party and um, and so you do have some of these tendencies again kind of authoritarian power structures um, submitting to uh, those that you believe are God-appointed authorities and not submitting to those that you do not believe are God-appointed authorities. And again, you determine <laughs> which are which. Um, and especially, I think, this um, us versus them worldview that is at the core of this militancy. Again, you always need enemies to fight. And those enemies in this tradition, and, and this is what I chart throughout the book, these enemies are always both domestic and foreign, right? So you have, you have actual wars to fight on the, you know, in, in terms of foreign policy. 
Um, and so you need strong military, you need to defend the nation and you need to you know, make sure that, you, that you're doing that. But you also have uh, domestic enemies. Again, liberals, feminists, Democrats, um, you know, LGBTQ community, right? You've got people that, that are, uh, this demonization happens internally as well. They are trying to undermine your faith system. They are trying to undermine our country from within. So it is a very polarizing ideology, uh, which I think has led to this uh, period of enhanced political polarization. It's not this idea that, um, you know, we're all in this together. We, we may disagree on how to get there, but we're all in this together. It's absolutely not, right? It's good and evil. And um, what has been lost in this corruption of the faith, as I mentioned before, is a, is a powerful sense of the common good of, again, loving your neighbors as yourself, um, loving your enemies even, and um, working together for shalom, for human flourishing. I uh, write those teachings of that, that I believe are, are right at the core of Christianity uh, really have been sidelined. And I think in, in that, we then um, are in this particularly fractured political moment because we have less, lost really any sense of a common good, of a good for all of those, even those outside of your particular fold. Mm -hmm. um, because this kind of militancy just doesn't allow for that. It requires that we not think in terms of a broader common good. Um, and so I think that leaves us in a very dangerous place right now, a very difficult place, um, but also a very dangerous place. Because what happens when we take this us versus them mentality and the ends will justify the means mentality and apply it to American democracy? right, to our democratic structures, to filling positions on the Supreme Court, to uh, a peaceful transfer of power, uh, right, to um, free and fair elections. If a significant subset of Americans and the majority of one political party has embraced uh, good versus evil, us versus them, ends will justify the means ideology, then that in fact leaves American democracy in a very vulnerable place. And that's where we are right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Billy Graham comes to mind. Not only do you mention him uh, significantly in the book, um, you, you reminded me when you wrote about him of, I was raised a Baptist kid and I have a hard time pinpointing when my conversion moment was. And so evangelicalism was on the fringe of Baptists. But as you also point out so eloquently and chronicle, uh, they snuck their agenda filled media into all sorts of unsuspecting denominations. Yes. And so Joshua Harris showed up in my church in the form of a girl who said she's reading it and a half year later had to get married because she was pregnant. <laughs> and so that, that was like his dating, uh, dating goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, where I was going is, um, no, I don't want to say anything bad about Billy Graham, but I hope I'm not. Uh, the thing that I remind, was reminded of was the crusade that was in Germany where Billy Graham was in Essen, which is a town very close to where I'm from. And my mom dragged us faithfully to every night of Pro Christ. And so I was able on YouTube to discover wow. the sermon, the first one where I stood up and as a nine year old and went and confessed and um, Maybe that was my conversion moment. I don't know, but I, the 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 yeah. sermon was hard to listen to, and I find it difficult to think that people were sitting there and thinking, "This is awesome. I want more of that." This was ninety three. The one very clear good thing that I can say about him is that he made it very clear that we have to pray for peace, and that um, racial. Uh, inequality is bad, that yeah. Christians should care about that. Everything else was fear-mongering, yeah. so much fear of the world. And he also, the narrative was basically even suicides, even depression is because 
not enough Christians or, or something. It was a weird connection to hell and your responsibility. And so you don't want to go to hell. But the world is also hell. And <laughs> if you accept Christ, then I don't know. It, it was very uh, dark and very simplistic. And uh, I turned it off. I did not make it through. It was too upsetting. But that's the sermon that I went up to um, confess. I want Jesus in my heart. Um, I don't want to go to hell. Wow. Okay. So first of all, in, in, you said in 93, this was the, so I was living in Germany in 1993, which is really an interesting point of connection. Um, but uh, I, I do want to talk about Billy Graham just a little bit. And Graham is a complicated figure. Um, and I've heard from many people who've read this book, you know, I had no idea how political Billy Graham was in his earlier days, because um, it, after Watergate, after he had been implicated in supporting Nixon and then, you know, Nixon's um, Watergate scandal, Billy Graham stepped back from explicitly partisan politics, right? And so he then, and then, you know, as he aged, he got this kind of grandfatherly role and his brand, and brand is so important in evangelicalism, his brand has just been evangelism, right? Soul-saving evangelism, revivalism, that's, that's Billy Graham. Um, but that's, that's not exactly true to history. And, um, and we need to complicate that. And, and I would suggest that certainly the politicized trajectory that he set is what has, has um, persisted far more than his stepping back and warning um, fellow evangelicals from being too, too partisan. Um, and certainly his son has, um, ha has not, um, uh, you know, followed his advice in, in that respect. But I would also say exactly what, what you pointed out with regard to this soul-saving revivalism, right? That the very teachings, the very gospel Christianity that he was presenting is caught up, it is, it is just permeated with this us versus them, good versus evil militancy, or at least seeds of militancy that find expression politically. And so a lot of people who had been writing about white evangelicalism and evangelicals in politics before um, kind of I, I came along and, and pushed back um, have been wanting to say there is this pure, good, spiritual evangelicalism that is, is somehow um, pristine and exists on its own apart from this politics. And sure, you have some evangelicals who take it in this, in this political direction, but you have others that take this pristine right faith and, and bring it in a progressive uh, you know, uh, direction. Or, and and I, um, I don't think that's quite how religion works, right? That, that the religion itself, when you listen to um, the prayers that are being prayed in evangelical churches, as I do when I visit different churches, yeah. they are deeply political. And if they, even if they don't name a candidate, they are presenting the issues and the worldview in a way that absolutely aligns with one political party and absolutely contradicts another political party. And so I think that we just need to be more curious about the, um, the, the mix of religion and politics so that maybe we can't even separate them in some ways. Um, and, and much more critical about the substance of our religious faith. Um, and who is forming those? Who is shaping that? Which sources of popular culture are really forming our spiritual commitments and to what ends? And, and that's really part of the process um, that I wanted to explore in this book. Just be a lot more curious about the values that we are, um, are being shaped by and the values that we are coming to hold through what seems to be just, um, you know, evangelism, um, soul-saving revivalism, gospel Christianity. It's a lot more complicated than that. And we should be a lot more curious about that. And be honest about the flip side. So what if they don't want to live like us? What if they don't want to say the words the way we say them? Yes. I have a few different ideas. But what you just said is actually the very first thing that I wrote down when I started reading. What state of mind were you in when you embraced certain toxic views? What fears did it meet inside of you? Yes. 
Yeah. And that's a question for cult survivors, for survivors of spiritual abuse to frequently ask yourself, am I falling again into a state of fear and I need a savior? I need some kind of a earthly solution to take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, would you say I'm a hypocrite because I'm clearly afraid that history could repeat itself in similar packaging? Well, I, I mean, there's fear um, and there's legitimate fear and there's fears that's being stoked. And of course, it's in the eye of the beholder right now. I, I think a lot of um, um, uh, politically, you know, allegations of fear are being leveled on both sides and of stoking up fears. Um, and so I think that um, there are some situations that should make people fearful and others not so much. I think that um, one of the things that has been important to me to sort out precisely this question, you know, what am I afraid of and what am I not afraid of? And that really is linking this um, idea of, of Christianity um, and of the fate of truth, the fate of the church, the fate of God even, you'll hear that language, um, to kind of what's happening around us um, politically, uh, culturally, and so on. That, uh, you know, kind of what, what we were talking about before, that, that if we believe in an all-powerful God, if we believe in the workings of the Spirit, then, uh, you know, we can, we can not have to take it upon ourselves to worry about the future of the church or the future of, of truth, right? That's not on us. And so if we just take that away and then think about, okay, what are we worried about right now? Um, uh, maybe uh, for me as a U.S. historian, I am worried about the strength of our democratic institutions. That's what I'm actually really worried about in this moment. And I do not believe that the truth of Christianity or the fate of God rests on that at all, right? And so it takes it away from this cosmic battle to a very important historical moment that we find ourselves in and political moment. And so I'm going to work on that, but I'm not working as, you know, I've got God's truth on my side and I will do anything possible because God's truth will justify anything, right? That's not what we're, what we're talking about. So I think it's important to separate this kind of cosmic battle mm -hmm. from the things that we think need to be done. And so on perhaps, you know, in the world of white evangelicals, maybe deeply concerned about their own religious liberties, right? As they were certainly under um, the Obama administration, um, particularly because they felt that they were losing a grasp on cultural values um, particularly around um, issues like gay marriage. Um, also, there's a demographic change that's been happening. Um, and so feeling like they, they were no longer going to be in the majority to be able to kind of enforce um, their values more broadly. And so this idea of religious liberty became all the more important, at least let us practice as we see fit, okay? Which, um, you know, I'll bracket that. I won't get into all of the ways in which does that privilege Christianity or not, but let's say, you know, that's a legitimate concern for this group. Um, then do you, you know, work politically to shore up religious liberty, or do you also link that to, and therefore the church of God is under siege, right? And that Christianity itself is under threat. And, and you can see the difference that the, um, whichever way you frame it will probably shape how you go about responding to this and you know whether you think even if we lose our right to deny um you know uh, uh, baking a cake for example um to an lgbt uh, or to a gay couple um is our faith dead right is our is our is 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 christianity going to die um, or or not and again this is going to change the um the urgency with which you address these but also the means you will use to address this perceived threat what kind of a threat are we actually talking about and can the witness of the church not only survive but maybe even thrive when it is constrained in some ways as historically uh, right historians of christianity will say absolutely has often the witness of the church has often thrived most in times of actual persecution um and so so it really is you know what kind of mindset are we taking um and then what are we willing to condone what are we willing to perpetrate ourselves in the name of of you know achieving our goals the ends justifying the means mm -hmm. yeah. uh. 
man so you said so many good things is there um i was gonna pick that up and say that culture wars on it that's kind of what you're talking about too is this fear that our moral values are losing ground in this country and we'll have to share the ground with people who have different moral values than us and potentially they're infiltrating our children and then we'll have to denounce our children or uh, <laughs> rethink things if they turn out to be gay uh, and the first time i've heard that word or those two words cultural wars was when i read brian zahn's the sinners and the hands and the loving god um, that really was a big changing point for me but that brings me that ties it back to billy graham that's what he was talking about yeah exactly yeah and so the war of the cultural of the culture which culture will be predominant in america is for a foreigner coming to this country very curious yeah. because it is obviously a melting pot mm -hmm. We have so many things happening all at once, and uh, then who's to say we were here first? <laughs> but uh, when I came here first, literally uh, in my first year as uh, fresh off the boat, I joined this evangelical church wide uh, prophetic prayer thing. And uh, there was a man there who's uh, pretty um, runs something big here in the city, and uh, I had no idea. And so I had no idea also that I had started to enter the stage of deconstruction, and that the first thing. I was deconstructing was my future view uh the view that it is bound to go all down the tubes and yeah. god has ordained it that there's a third world war and then the end comes isn't that what revelation says so clearly and so that was one of the first things that i uh, started to question and read books that had diff showed different opinions and so i remember after he had shared his prophetic dream of everything going down the tubes and he was there with the bible and whatever it was a dream like that um i i, I shared that i have a different view and then i said something about that um, this idea that this is a Christian country and this made sense in the conversation I do not remember anymore the context, but I said something about that. I don't know that this is a Christian nation he stood up and said in This country you have the right to be a Christian That's what the founding fathers were establishing in the Constitution and then he said as he left he knows people that would not stay in the room with someone like me and he left yeah 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 this idea of a christian nation is very much a part of um this this entire mindset and very closely linked to this um this role of militant christian manhood too uh because um uh, it, and that's why I mean, even right now, politically, uh, American history has become this really interesting kind of battleground just in recent weeks yeah. about, you know, these larger cultural values. What kind of a country do we live in and um, and what makes for a Christian nation? And th this has been a lively topic of debate for decades in Christian communities and Christian academic communities. And there has always been this kind of Christian nationalist strand saying that, you know, this is a Christian nation. God created us to be his special people. You know, you've got Israel and you have the United States and we are God's favorites and we are God's, you know, kind of um, city on a hill, light to the world. And so we have this super special mission. Um, and, and then there are others who will say, Oh, what does it mean to be a Christian nation? Does that mean that all Americans were Christian? Well, clearly they weren't. You know, then we start doing some historical analysis. Does that mean that we lived according to Christian values? Well, what do we do about slavery? What do we do about, you know, the oppression of women, about the killing of native populations? And, you know, very quickly historical evidence start to gather and say, well, clearly it doesn't mean that we behaved in a Christian way. Um, actually, you know, historically, um, I write about this in the early 20th century, many conservative Protestants rejected the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation because they believed that to be a Christian meant to have a conversion experience, a personal conversion experience, 
soul saving. And a nation did not have a soul. And so it made no sense to say that a nation could be Christian, that the nation was non-Christian, right? And then you like Christians were drawn out of that and into the true church. Um, and so that was really interesting in World War I, for example, you had many conservative Protestants who were not militaristic, who were not bringing their faith to defend the nation, when in fact you had more liberal Protestants who were more comfortable with that, I mean, with some exceptions on both ways. But, um, you know, just the, the, what we see now, this idea of America is a Christian nation, um, and that is just a deeply held conviction among conservative evangelicals, um, and that especially appointed by God, that means that they, as, as they perceive themselves, the, the faithful Christian remnant, have special power and they have a special duty in this nation. And they can't help but see everything that's happened since as some kind of declension, as a loss of this original faithful Christianity, which historians will say is just not historically accurate. It is a myth, right? It is a, it's a powerful myth. It's a founding myth but it is a myth. And so it, 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 it can be very dangerous to try to recreate something that never actually existed and to do so, you know, centuries out in a very different uh, context. And, and that, that is not going to work out well, and it will not be able to be achieved without a lot of coercion and potentially violence in order to do so. And so um, I, I think that's that's definitely what we're seeing, but, um, and that's where this kind of militant masculinity comes in because you're gonna need, you're going to need to fight to reimpose this mythical state. And um, that fighting might look like ruthless political engagement. Uh, it might, it might look like a more physical threat at some point as well. It's not clear what that will look like and it will look different for different people. But this idea that we have to fight to restore something that we've lost is uh, rooted to this mythical conception of Christian America. Which then of course uh, explains the logic why someone can say, I could go and shoot someone on Fifth Street and I wouldn't lose one follower that yeah. that would sound like that's the kind of ruthlessness that will take care of our agenda. That is what we need, um, uh, right? That's how the thinking goes. And um, again, going back to what I discovered early on and when I started to read about you know, Christian manhood, uh, this, the fact that Christian writers were so often looking <laughs> somewhat ironically outside of of Christian communities for their heroes, for um, for the ruthless warriors that they thought, you know, Christians needed to be more like. Christian men, don't be like Mr. Rogers. Certainly don't be like Mother Teresa. Be like William Wallace. Be like John Wayne, right? And the fact that, um, so somebody like, you know, our current president, who uh, most people agree has not been deeply shaped by traditional Christian virtues, um, say love, joy, peace, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, right? That ironically, that is precisely why he is so well equipped to serve as the ruthless protector of Christianity, of American Christians, and of Christian America. Then to come to a close, though, what I discover is that I have so much more that I would like to talk to you about, but um, what honor your time and the fact that you clearly don't believe that we solve our problems with violence of any kind but with truth and with proper knowledge what is your hope for this time for yourself right now um I, I, I have, when I finished this book, I, I didn't have a lot of hope, honestly, because as a historian, I could see how deeply entrenched and attractive these ideas have been for, for generations now. Um, the hope has come after the publication. I, I have heard from so many evangelicals themselves who are deep inside these systems, these organizations, these churches, um, who have participated in this, who have built this culture who are reaching out to me now, like hundreds, saying thank you, and saying, 
ultimately coming to the realization, not just through this book, but by other things that are going on, saying this is not the faith that I believe in. This is not the Jesus of the gospels, this, this warrior Christ. And thank you for helping me to see. Um, and I have been absolutely overwhelmed. That has been so uh, well received, um, enthusiastically, graciously received by the very people that I'm writing about. Um, and, and that has given me hope. I have also heard from many of these people that they have not felt that they have, that, that they could speak out, mm -hmm. that they did not. Um, I've heard from so many pastors who are afraid that they will lose their churches if they speak truth in this moment. Um, family members afraid that they will lose relationships with other family members, um, that they will, um, people who, who don't want to disrupt the, you know, uh, their churches. And so there's, there's uh, at, at the same time as, as people are, are kind of seeing this truth, they are also afraid to speak this truth. And so I think in this moment, I have a lot of hope because of what I am hearing from people. Um, but I am also hopeful that um, people who are convicted will feel empowered to speak out and to speak their truth in this moment and to trust that when they do so, they will find other people who are speaking that truth. And this is not something that we need to do individually. This is something that we can be doing in community and um, by supporting each other. And so, so I do hope that this is a time actually of, um, of courage and of boldness for um, Christians, for American Christians, white American Christians in particular. Okay, thank you so much. As you say in your conclusion, just because the way the things the way things are right now and we know why they are the way things are, doesn't mean they have to stay that way. Yeah. Yes. So Jesus and John Wayne uh, is your book. Uh, and you can get it anywhere, especially Amazon or uh, any bookstore too. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for your time, Kristen. Oh, thank you. This is a great conversation. I'm really happy to have had a chance to talk. Thank you.